Good evening. I am Guido Podesta, Vice Provost and Dean of the International Division. It is my pleasure to welcome you all tonight. Tonight's reading and discussion marks two significant celebrations for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The first is our continuing celebration of 60 years of the Peace Corps. Since 1961, 3,369 Badgers have served around the world. We have a strong legacy of service, shown that UW-Madison has continued to be ranked as the number one school for volunteers the last two, at least the last two rounds. This activity is also being held as a keynote event for International Education Week. International Education Week, a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of the States and the U.S. Department of Education, is a national celebration of the benefits of international education and exchange worldwide. We have entered this fall semester with a strong sense of optimism. The students are studying abroad and participating in international internships. Record student application numbers indicate a strong sense of enthusiasm for re-engaging the world as we continue to carefully assess and open the program locations. Research collaborations have persisted over the, last, the past month and are building momentum in many cases. And the university has resumed welcoming dignitaries to campus to meet with the students and faculty and discuss avenues of, for co cooperation. Among those we have welcomed in recent weeks include Penny Lukito, a UW Madison alum who serves as head of the Indonesia's FDA as well as being King Xiao, representative of the Republic of China, Taiwan. I would like to thank all of our co-sponsors for this event, the Wisconsin School of Business, which is hosting a live watch party in Madison, the Peace Corps, the Burgridge Center for Public Service, the Tommy G. Thompson Center for Public Leadership, the Institute for Regional and International Studies, and the Peace Corps Advocates. It is wonderful and very telling to have so many campus units and community organizations eager to sponsor this event and disseminate the message of our speaker. I would also like to extend my thanks and a heartfelt welcome to Ambassador Rick Barton for participating in this event. I hope we can welcome you to campus in the near future. There is much I could say about Aaron Williams. He has led an exceptional career, both domestically and on the world stage. He has been a champion for international engagement and the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he continues to be a strong supporter of UW Minds, elevating future leaders and creating opportunities for new generation of budgets. We are pleased to have Aaron with us tonight and proud to call him one of our own. Without further ado, I would like to invite my colleague, Barry Gerhardt, to introduce our speaker and discuss him. Barry Gerhardt, who is the Bruce, who is the Bruce R. Ellick Distinguished Chair in Pay and Organizational Effectiveness in the, School of, in, in the Department of Management and Human Resources at the Wisconsin of School of Business. Thank you, Bill, please. Thank you, Vice Provost Podesta. On behalf of the Wisconsin School of Business, it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome and introduce our moderator and our featured speaker. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have Ambassador Rick Barton joining us as moderator. Ambassador Barton teaches at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, where he serves as co-director of the Scholars in the Nation's Service Initiative. Ambassador Barton has a strong history of global leadership he was the first Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations, America's Ambassador to the Economic and Social Council of the UN, and the UN's Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva. He also founded USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. He led peacebuilding efforts in over 40 crisis zones across the globe, including Haiti, Iraq, Nigeria, Burma, and Pakistan. Ambassador Barton is also an author of PeaceWorks, America's Unifying Role in a Turbulent World. 
Though a Boston University graduate, Ambassador Barton has deep connections here. His wife, daughter, father-in-law, nephew, grandmother, and great aunt all received degrees from UW-Madison. His great, great uncle was the librarian of the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison, where his portrait hangs. His great uncle's collected papers are curated in the same historical society library. Given your deep connections, I'd like to say not only welcome, but also welcome home. <laughs> and we're delighted to have you with us this evening, Ambassador. Thank you. And, and next, it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Aaron Williams, an alumnus of the Wisconsin School of Business. His distinguished career in public service has seen him assume leadership roles in some of our nation's most critical agencies for furthering global cooperation, development, and peace. In his book, A Life Unimagined, Mr. Williams observes that he has traveled a long way from his working class and segregated neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Let me share with you some of the many things he accomplished on his journey. At USAID, he reached the rank of career minister in the Senior Foreign Service and served as executive secretary, the first African American to do so. He also served as USAID mission director in South Africa, where he led a billion dollar foreign assistance program during President Nelson Mandela's administration. Mr. Williams began his life of service as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic from 1967 to 1970. Decades later, he was sworn in as its director and led the Peace Corps from 2009 to 2012, the first African-American man to do so. He has continued to provide expertise and support for government agencies, policymakers, and elected officials. This includes serving in senior leadership roles at RTI, an independent nonprofit institute dedicated to improving the human condition around the world. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, serves on numerous boards and committees, and is a frequent lecturer and panelist on international development topics around the world. His many honors include several honorary doctorates, as well as the USAID Distinguished Career Service Award. He also received the Presidential Award for Distinguished Service, not once, but twice. To conclude, let me quote President Barack Obama. America was built on a belief that the best progress comes from ordinary citizens working to bring about the change they believe in. Through a lifetime of service, Aaron Williams has embodied the very best of that American ideal. Mr. Williams, we are honored to have you with us tonight, and we are very proud to call you one of our own. And now I would like to turn the stage over to Ambassador Barton to begin what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be part of this Wisconsin celebration. As you mentioned, it is a homecoming of sorts. And thanks to uh, Vice Provost Dean Podesta, Barry, thank you for your remarks. And of course, it's great to be here with my great friend, Aaron Williams. Um, Aaron and I go back a, a short while by his standards, I guess, um, only to 1994 when when I uh, when we worked together at USAID, and I just come down from the state of Maine, and you can imagine that Aaron early on enveloped me in his welcoming embrace and and warmed my arrival with his infectious laughter, which we're all going to enjoy multiple times tonight, I'm sure. Uh, his book builds off of these platforms of inclusivity and and curiosity, building bridges between people and sectors and, and just embracing challenges. It's a burst of positivity um, with an unrelenting generosity of spirit. 
It makes the reading an uplifting experience. It's like getting a straight shot of Aaron and what could be better. Um, if this book doesn't make you feel better, seek professional help. Uh, <laughs> Aaron's story is one of service, family and friendships and how they led to a series of remarkable opportunities. It's personal and the story of a career. Wherever Aaron went, he brought integrity and concern for others as Helene Gale says in the foreword. He followed Sergeant Shriver's guidance to communicate and empathize. He loved representing America's values, generosity and hope. And he showed Sam Farr's deep, shared Sam Farr's deep affection for the, for the Peace Corps and its quote, uplifting side of America. I'm looking forward to this 30 minute conversation and then the follow on Q and A that we're all gonna have with Aaron and know that you wanna offer and, and know that, off, that Aaron wants to offer his thanks first before we start our conversation, Aaron. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. Good evening. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual book launch. We all wanted to be together, but because of COVID, of course, we had to make other plans. First of all, I'd like to thank Dean Podesta for his gracious support of this book project and for the warm welcome he's always giving me when I arrived there to serve on his advisory board. Professor Gerhardt, thank you for those kind words, and I'm so proud to be an alum of the University of Wisconsin School of Business. My graduate studies at this great university and my MBA degree were instrumental in launching my career. And a special thanks to Ambassador Rick Barton. Rick, my good friend and former colleague, thank you for that very warm introduction. And it's really hard to believe, Rick, that it's been almost three decades since we became colleagues and friends. And then finally, I'm pleased that this event is part of the celebration of International Education Week, because as we all know, international education and exchange programs are key to global engagement and global understanding. So thank you very much. I look forward to our conversation, Rick. Great, Aaron. Well, as everybody who knows you, and I know this call is going to be populated by lots and lots of people who have known you and love you. Um, but whenever, whenever we run into you or when you call us, you always start off by saying, my friend. Um, and so we are happy to be there. Um, um, and that shows up in this, that friendship is really your personal and professional anchor along with your family. Um, whether it's Harry Simmons or Stacey Rose, Esther Benjamin, Harris Wofford, whoever, these people that you have befriended are really the, 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 the source of great happiness and, and productivity and, and uh, other rewards. So how did this become the centerpiece of your life? And at what point did you notice it? And, and, and what has it meant in your career? How, how, do you, how do you want to talk about that? Well, you know, Rick, I think it started out probably when I was growing up in Chicago because I was much older than uh, my siblings by a significant number of years. And so I was often... Uh, alone uh, with adults, and I learned to develop friendships, and I learned to be discerning about the people that I became friends with. It was really important to me. So I think that's where it all started. And then I think the, the real transformative part of my life was the Peace Corps. So I arrived uh, in San Diego State to train for the Peace Corps in 1967. I'm the only Black person among a group of 70 trainees and they embraced me. We were kindred spirits. My great roommate, Dennis Kroger, really helped me figure out a way to approach how to learn Spanish. And I think from that basis on, from that moment on, I've always treasured my friendships. I tried to keep them close, even no matter how many thousands of miles separate us. It's always been important. And I've also been very fortunate, Rick, such as the case is with you and many others and the people you just mentioned, that not only have we become friends, we were able to be colleagues two or three times together. I can't think of any greater gift. You know, maybe Aaron, just to uh, get your book right in front of people right away, if, if you could go to page one forty nine and uh, turn to turn to uh, Williams' rules, 
<laughs> I just, uh, I love those. These were given to Aaron when he, as he was leaving, departing from the International Youth Foundation. And maybe you could tell the story around how they how they came to be as well as read that paragraph, which which starts off with uh, my wife, my IYF family. Well, this is there. my departure, right? My from IYF. Yes. My IYF family of friends and associates created a special going away gift for me. They called it the Williams Rules, which they had printed on small cards. By the way, my son still have it. <laughs> many of my friends. The rules were. Be kind to everyone. Hire the smartest people you can find. Give them far more responsibility than they can handle. Don't get mad if they make a mistake. Always acknowledge good work. Don't meddle. If the situation requires, create a new rule. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could maybe you could tell us about uh, one of those times that you had to create a new rule uh, where the we're, There's been an yeah. occasion where I had to create a new rule. I think every time I took on a new assignment, a new role, I had to create a new rule because I encountered new, new situations. Uh, certainly, I think when I first started out my career in AID in Honduras, we thought we were going to uh, to convince Honduran farmers to plant tomatoes in the Comayagua Valley in central Honduras. And that was going to be the way to approach it. But I, had, I quickly had to I found out that in actuality, we we're going to have to plant cucumbers because of the agronomic situation in that valley. So I had to create a new rule, which was be flexible in the face of new data. <laughs> <laughs> That's the equivalent of, of uh, the, the plan goes out the window the, the minute the first uh, bullet is fired. Huh? Yeah. Or I think Mike Tyson said the first time you get hit in the face is the end of your strategy. Yeah. Right. You know, one of the, one of the things I really liked about the book is that every so often you raised the, uh, a, a a a principle of the book, uh, you 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 lifted it in raised type basically, and it's uh, there's one on page ninety six. I don't know if I can get you to read that, but it speaks to sort of how you how you uh, use these relationships to build your teams and and uh, and other and other critical. So it's the it's the box on page ninety six. Mm -hmm. okay, um, if you would. I'm not going to have you do this all no, night. That's okay. I'm good. This is this is fine. So I said, no matter what the situation or circumstances appears to be, there will always be opportunities to create meaningful relationships. And you never know when they will be the difference between success and failure in future endeavors or events. And I can tell you, Rick, that that has been the case for me so many times, I can't even keep count of how mm -hmm. it's been the case. For example, look at our relationship. You and I first met when you came in to work uh, under Brian Atwood and the Clinton administration, right? And created this an amazing office of transition initiatives. And then we end up being on the transition team together for Obama. And then we end up being colleagues in the Obama administration, right? So that has happened many, many times in my career. Uh, Esther Benjamin has worked with me in two different places, uh, the International Youth Foundation and, and at the Peace Corps. And I could go on and on. It's, it's certainly been the case that relationships that started out as friendships have developed into strong, important, collegial, professional relationships. There's no no doubt that that's a major, major theme of the book. I'd like to talk a little bit about a, another theme that comes through clearly, and that's sort of taking on risks. And you like uh, you like making career choices. You've had to make some really interesting ones. You've gone in and out of government. You've gone in and out of the private sector. Um, so you've been more agile than many people, but every time there was a, not every time, but there were family conversations, uh, there were other choices that, you, that were facing you. And I just wonder what, what made you comfortable with taking on risk? I mean, right at the early, early on, uh, you, you showed uh, an ability to do that. And what, what were some of the, some of the uh, anchors that allowed you to do that? Well, I think the first anchor, as you say, uh, was the Peace Corps, because I had to make a, a big decision. The only people in, in, my, in my family and friends that thought that me going to the Peace Corps was a good idea was my mother and my longtime childhood friend, Harry Simmons, who we've been friends since the eighth grade. And I don't know why the two of them thought this was such a great idea, because I was determined to do it. But once I joined the Peace Corps, that made all the difference in the world. 
that was a launching pad. It was transformative. It gave me a chance to find out more about Aaron Williams. It gave me a chance to become more resilient, uh, obviously to, to learn another culture, to learn a foreign language. And I was fortunate enough, to, of course, to meet my lifetime partner, my dear wife, Rosa, in the Dominican Republic. So after I took on that challenge, Rick, and was successful as a Peace Corps volunteer, I served in the DR for three years. I think that gave me the grounding to understand that risk-taking is something that one should consider carefully, but never be afraid, never shy away from it, because it can lead to really productive, outstanding career moves. Talk a little bit about your mother in that decision to... Well, my mother was always my champion. You know, she was she uh, managed the Chicago public school system better than most. So I went to five different elementary schools because she was never satisfied with the quality <laughs> of education in the school I was in. She was always looking for the next better school. So yeah. I had to memorize a lot of new addresses from time to time. I was always the new kid. And so, but she said to me all the time, work hard and you will do well and I'm convinced you're gonna do well. And God bless her because she was there. She was my beacon, she was my shining light, made all the difference in the world. So you, you've obviously had some wonderful women in your life. Uh, talk a little bit about Rosa's role in this risk-taking because you've had to, you, you picked up in, at a critical time in your kids' life, lives and yeah. uh, went to South Africa, which was obviously a huge, huge experience, but you've had, uh, there were other, other tough calls, I'd say. Well, I think, you know, as all of us who served in the Foreign Service know, it's a family affair, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and when Rosa and I had grown up in, in Latin America in our AID careers, and so when I suggested that we take on the assignment of South Africa, uh, she, was, she was hesitant, she was concerned, uh, but we sat down, the four of us, uh, Rosa, my son Stephen, my son Michael, and we decided that this is something that we thought First of all, it was the right thing to do. It was a historic moment. I was grateful that Brian Atwood considered me for that job. And I felt that South Africa was a place where we could make a difference. It was a historic moment, of course, with the democratic transformation that was underway with Nelson Mandela. And Rosa was a trooper. She said, let's do it. We went to South Africa. It was not an easy transition because South Africa was still coming out of the apartheid era. We were the only black family uh, for blocks and blocks in Pretoria where we lived. Uh, we had some strange strange times going out shopping in the neighborhood, uh, but Rosa was a champ. She handled it, she managed uh, our sons very well. And the other day we sat down and talked about South Africa and the vote was unanimous. All four of us felt this was probably the best decision we'd ever made as a family. And on top of that, I had one hell of a team in South Africa. I had some outstanding people who have gone on to have superb careers. Many of the people that you, uh, many people on this call have, have no, no well. Uh, I don't want to mention them right now because I might forget somebody important. <laughs> because they all are important. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> ambassadors, you USAID mission directors, CEOs of corporations. So it was a glorious time. I used to tell my staff that we are like the Yankees. We cannot be taken down. We're always playing at World Series level. It was a marvelous time. What 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 team was that? You've heard of that team before. The one that's won more <laughs> world championships <laughs> than the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, that that may be that, that's a point of controversy. We will return to if <laughs> if, if needed. You know, but maybe uh, Aaron, you could go to page eighty six. And at the bottom there, you at the bottom of that page, uh, 86, you talk about what it takes to be successful in Washington. And I think the definition that you use is really different than what a lot of people would assume, because there are a heck of a lot of people who think that taking risk is a bad idea in Washington. Mm -hmm. And your your statement here suggests otherwise. And I, I, I think it's I think people need to hear it. Is this where I, sorry, I learned that? Is yes, that you want to yeah, exactly, if you would. This is in the, in working in Washington. I learned that people who don't succeed in Washington are those who are uncomfortable with, with risk. Exercising caution in the Washington game is like getting caught in quicksand. You quickly lose your grounding, and without a strong network of, network of support, you pull out when you might sink. 
Then there are those who don't mind risk but hate the game. That's also a losing proposition. The only way to master the Washington game is to value and recognize the importance of the work, understand how to manage and work the game without hating the game. I learned this from many incredible leaders I was fortunate enough to get to know and work with, many of whom became my lifelong friends. Right. And do you want to do you want to expand on that at all? I mean, I've always I've always felt that you have to have a perverse fascination with bureaucracy if you're going to succeed in Washington. Uh, but you say it much more eloquently. Well, I think also the other thing about that I always enjoyed about my career at USAID is that AID allows you, if you're willing to, to take some risks, to be entrepreneurial. Rick, you're a perfect example of that. You were extraordinarily entrepreneurial in setting up your new office. Uh, and I think that Brian Atwood, who we worked for at the time, he encouraged us to take risks within reason. And if you're entrepreneurial, you're willing to take risks, and you have a good team behind you, I think you can manage the Washington game very effectively. Also, I had, I knew I had some great people that I worked for in Washington, including Ambassador James Michael, you know, probably the master of Washington in all, in all aspects of that in terms of diplomacy. I learned a lot from him. He was a man of man. He is a man of great integrity. Yeah. And that counts for a lot. Excellent. Well, let's spend a little bit of time. You, you have, you have more than a fascination with leadership. You've really been, you're an admirer of it. You've developed your own very strong uh, instincts and, and style. Um, and you've been blessed by your exposure to many great leaders, as you make clear throughout the book, whether it's at AID or whether it was Mandela, uh, uh, Bishop Tutu. I mean, just lots and lots of uh, fascinating people. What are some of your major takeaways? Paul Bell, you also mentioned. Um, I think that, well, let me just say that my first boss in AID was Tony Carterucci, who was one of the great all-time mission directors of AID. And Tony was, again, a man of great integrity, someone who was a great listener, who empowered you and gave you a chance to do the work. And if you were ever caught up in a bind and needed help, he was there to step up and support you. I modeled my leadership after Tony. Luckily, he was my first boss in AID. And I was able to continue that. When I worked in South Africa, I worked under another tremendous leader, a great servant leader, uh, Ambassador James Joseph. Uh, we could spend an hour talking about the things he's accomplished and what he did. He, again, was someone who empowered you, gave you an opportunity and the latitude to make decisions, and supported you in, when times were tough when you faced challenges. Uh, and then we have, of course, if you want to talk about leadership, Nelson Mandela, who I was able to observe somewhat close up in South Africa. How does a man come out of 27 years of prison without being bitter? How does he manage to, to knit together the different ethnic and racial groups in that country to create a democratic transformation. Uh, when you see something like that, you have to be humble and you have to wonder, what can I do to become a better leader? Talk a little bit about your first uh, first meeting with Nelson Mandela. And, and, and also, you, I mean, you've got, you've kind of, you have a vaccine story, which is, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a, a fun piece of that first, of that first meeting. That's Maybe right. Well, I'll, I'll try to do it very quickly. So Brian Atwood was named to Nelson Mandela's task force to uh, eradicate polio from Africa. There was still a couple of pockets of polio in Africa at the time I went out to South Africa in 96. And so there was going to be the kickoff ceremony, and I was about to arrive in South Africa within the week. So Brian asked me if I would be his representative on the Mandela task force. The other members of the task force were uh, the first lady of uh, of uh, Congo, Bra Congo, Brazzaville, the First Lady of Ghana, the head of the World Health Organization, and the president of the International Rotary. Those were the partners. And the people in Aid Washington assured me that I would not have to make a speech or give remarks at this event. It would merely be a photo op. But being uh, somewhat experienced in, in, in the rules and regs of the bureaucracy, I decided I better brush up on what AID was doing in polio, which of course was almost nothing. And so I looked very carefully at the South Africa public health portfolio and Rosa and our boys flew out to South Africa. My first day on the job was the day we had the, the great conference to launch uh, the kick, out, kick polio out of Africa. And I never expected that President Mandela was gonna show up. A lot of uh, leaders and celebrities don't show up, they merely lend their name. But I didn't know Nelson Mandela, he always showed up. 
And so when he arrived at the convention center, the minister of health told the chief of his chief of staff said, the president would like for you to make a, each of you to make a presentation of what your organizations are doing to support the eradication of polio in Africa. So I said, well, that's not going to work for AID. So I've got to come up with another thing to discuss with the president. So I decided to tell him a personal story. And I told President Mandela, we were in a very small room, just the four of us, very private. I said, President Mandela, when I was driving over here today, I asked my son if they knew, I asked my sons if they knew what polio was. My younger son, Stephen, who was in high school, had no idea what polio was. My older son, Michael, who was pre-med at the time, knew it was a childhood disease that had been eradicated. And so I told President Mandela that when I was a child, I was in the first cohort of, of children to receive the salt vaccine. And we lined up and got our shot and polio was eradicated. And we lived in fear in those days in urban areas of polio and across the country. There were scenes of children, iron lungs. Uh, it was people on crutches. It was horrible. And then it disappeared with the vaccine. So I turned to President Mandela and I said, President Mandela, my wish for Africa, my fervent wish for Africa is that the children of Africa will grow up and have no knowledge of polio in Africa. Mandela smiled faintly and reached over and patted me on the back and said, I would agree with that. <laughs> so I, I, I told Rosa that and I said, I should just go home now. I think I've accomplished my mission. I got a pat on the back from Nelson Mandela. I think it's time to return home. <laughs> well, it's always good to start strong. That's um, right. So you can only go downhill from that. <laughs> so, so you you've had you've become your a leader of your in your own right, and you've developed your own key principles. And I wonder if you could just go quickly to page 180, 181, where you, you spend a, a bit of time talking about building a team. And I think maybe the simplest way is to read that that uh, box, the the raised. Uh, principle there because I think there are a lot of people who who just don't spend as much time at the Peace Corps. You since you were completely in charge of the Peace Corps, you really decided you what you needed for a team and you went after it. And this quote I think sets that story up a bit. Well, never assume a leadership role with a group of strangers. Effective leadership requires that you hire or appoint the best people available for your team and have that team poised to join you on day one. I'm a firm believer in that because I've studied leadership and leaders uh, in government, in business, and I've never seen anyone successful who did not have their team. Now, it's hard to do in government, but I was very fortunate that the uh, the people in presidential personnel uh, in the Obama administration gave me quite a bit of latitude to select my own people. And so I was very fortunate that I was able to bring on my team people like Carrie Hessel Radlett, who is really Peace Corps royalty. She's got three different generations of people in her family who served in the Peace Corps as deputy director. My friend and colleague in crime for many, many years, Stacy Rhodes. I started out in Haiti and early in my career and, and knew Stacy, we worked together. Uh, Stacy uh, followed me in South Africa as mission director uh, when I uh, left uh, USAID. So I was very, very fortunate that I was given the latitude to bring on people like Stacy and Carrie uh, and uh, Esther Benjamin and a number of other people that were instrumental in forming a strong team at Peace Corps. And of course, I was also very fortunate because I inherited a large number of outstanding career people at Peace Corps who had been serving there for a number of years and who just did a terrific job. Uh, so we were very we were very lucky, but it also fit very, very much into my framework of don't start out a new job or take on a big challenge with a team of strangers. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Aaron, about uh, writing a book, um, because you're now an accomplished author, and uh, you, I'd like you to describe your early days of, of discovering Chicago libraries and what that meant, meant to you, and then maybe also tell us a little bit about some of these great quotes that you start each chapter with, because they are they're not just famous people saying good things. They really fit your text so well. And then I've, then I've got a few other questions about the book, but I want to read the Eleanor Roosevelt quote. But tell us about Chicago. Tell us about 
kind of well, well as I said, family. because I was much older than my siblings. You know, I was alone with adults quite a bit. And uh, I found refuge in the Chicago Public Libraries, especially one particular library, Chatham Branch on the South Side. And the librarians adopted me and they knew I was a science fiction fanatic. So they allowed me to read the new books when they arrived. If I would come in on Saturday and sit down and read the book. So I'd read the book from you know front to back on Saturdays. And I went through a lot of books in those libraries. And my name was usually at the top of the cart. <laughs> so that's, that's one thing. And I think that uh, I tried to keep in mind uh, thoughts and quotes and, and lessons learned from, from great leaders, Rick. And that's, that served me very, very well. Well, you, the, the book has got wonderful little quotes throughout. You've got a great one from Rick Little in there uh, that, uh, that I, 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 I'll come back to in a second. I love this Eleanor Roosevelt quote, which says, the purpose of life, after all, is to live it to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for a newer and richer experience. And uh, I mean, that's clearly uh, woven throughout the, the book. Tell, tell me a little bit about finding finding your voice as you're writing the book and and some of the choices well, you had to make and, 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 and how, you know, just the, the, the logistics of putting a, to, a book together in your case. Well, I was, uh, I had been keeping notes for a long time, right? I'm a, I'm a, a note taker. And uh, I kept notes. They were not really well organized. And, uh, and my friend, Harry Simmons, once again, was whispering in my ear for quite some time that I should write a book about my life. And I decided I wanted to write a book for two reasons. Number one was I wanted to see if my unimagined life could be a, a guidepost for minorities who wanted to consider a career in international development or in foreign affairs broadly. Because... People who grew up in conditions like I did, you know, uh, you know, from a humble background, working class family. I was the first person to graduate from college in my family. Uh, the Peace Corps opened up doors for me. And I wanted to see if I could provide some, some guideposts for uh, young people of color because we need to have a diverse uh, representative core of people representing the United States to re represent our diversity. And so I thought maybe I could provide some insight. And secondly, I wanted to write the book, Rick, because I wanted to, to express uh, my views about my career and, and, and Rosa and I's life in the Foreign Service in my own words, uh, from, through my own eyes, as a legacy for my five grandsons. So I was really became compelled. And then I, I was very fortunate because Carol Peasley, my friend and colleague from USAID, was part of a project uh, with the American Diplomatic Studies and Training uh, organization uh, in conjunction with USAID and the USAID Alumni Association to do oral histories. And so Carol sat down with me for about six or seven interviews of two hours each or more. And I, and we came up with my oral history. So that gave me then the core and the basis for writing the memoir. So I was very fortunate those events all dovetailed together. I want to reaffirm your your good note taking because here here on page one forty one you don't have to read it I'll read it for you that you got you you remembered uh, Rick Little's quote was that quote every child deserves at least one adult who is irrationally committed to them end quote I mean yeah. I just I love that idea yeah, we uh, live by that at the International Youth Foundation right you know that's yeah. something that my friend Bill Reese who was the COO and then the president. Uh, believes in that and, and something that uh, our friend and colleague Susan Rackley continues as a president of that organization. It's very true. So you've, you're, a, you're a big, big fan of, of uh, former Peace, uh, Peace Corps volunteers and, and you make a strong case for why their experience matters and when given a, a choice, you're going to hire one. And I just think your description on page 215, if you could turn to that, is is really priceless. Um, you 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 give this quote as background to talking to some parents. Why should my kid mm -hmm. waste their time for two years just when they're mm -hmm. about graduated from college and they're about to go out and make some money? And uh, you talk about it as an investment in their child's career. But then you then you make a strong strong case there where it says first and foremost. Uh, if you would read that sure. phrase, because 
I mean, yeah. that is that is really a priceless description of these people. Well, you know, because many times, Rick, uh, parents will say, why should my child go to graduate school or start a job? Why should they waste two years in the Peace Corps? So I would say, first and foremost, I know that if I hire this individual who's had Peace Corps service, they will be resilient and, and, and have overcome challenges as a Peace Corps volunteer. Second, I know they will speak one or two foreign languages. Third, I know they will be both superb team players and team leaders and will possess what I, what I like to call cultural agility, the ability to appreciate differences in others and have the ability to communicate and reach understandings with people of widely varying backgrounds. Therefore, as an executive in a global organization, in this case, such as RTI, it was imperative that we interview these individuals. And this is why I believe that service in the Peace Corps is an investment in a, person, in a person's future career. You know, I usually didn't get much pushback from that once I made that statement at some of these events that we held on college campuses, right? Because it's a legitimate question, a uh, pragmatic question that parents would ask, right? Yeah. No, it sounds good. I know, I think we're ready to to uh, start calling for questions from the audience. Um, and maybe as we're, as we're waiting for that, um, I could get you to read on page 178, uh, your your friend Phil Gary's rather, I think, profound endorsement of the Peace Corps mission as well, and sort of how it operates and why it's very real there at the bottom of page 178. So you said away. So this is Philip from Philip Gary, who is a colleague and a friend, dear friend and colleague at USAID, and a real um, foreign policy uh, guru in many ways. So a wise foreign policy expert, my former colleague, Phil Gary, once told me that one of the reasons Peace Corps is so successful is that it is premised on putting individuals in dynamic situations for relatively short durations where their individuality is the institutional action lane. It is absolutely unique among governmental institutions. And these individuals often bring creativity, dynamism, and positive development outcomes. I was eager to do everything I could to foster this type of resilience and sense of service among volunteers and to provide them with the support they needed to succeed. So let me, uh, I think I'm supposed to read these questions that come in from the from the audience. Okay. Um, if that's not correct, just let me know in the chat if you would. But the first question, you've talked about mission-driven work and you also mentioned the Peace Corps is a bipartisan supported organization. As a leader in the realm that you've worked, Peace Corps and otherwise, how do you maintain focus and help others remain focused on the mission when there may be political or other external influences wanting to change course or cause mission creep? Well, I think one of the great things that Peace Corps has, which is uh, fundamental and foundational in many ways, is that when Sergeant Shriver created the Peace Corps, he created three goals. And Peace Corps has uh, been committed to those three goals uh, for 60 years. And that helps us stay focused on the mission. The other thing I think is that most of the other uh, uh, agencies in the foreign policy arena recognize Peace Corps' special, unique quality and focus. And they give us a lot of latitude and space to operate in. And, and, and given that we, in my uh, in my uh experience in the Obama administration, we had very collegial relationships across all of the foreign affairs agencies, and it was actually not difficult to keep focused, to stay focused on the mission. So here's another question from the audience, which timely as well. Diversity and equity continue, continue to be dominant, converse, dominant in the U.S. conversation. How can we work to grow representation in all government agencies and what do you see as the current barriers? Well, I think that we need to have a diverse representation of America around the world, without a doubt, uh, across all government agencies. I think a couple of the barriers are, number one, you have to create a talent pool. You know, you have to have, a, if you want to use a baseball analogy, you have to have a farm system. And that starts not in college. It starts before college. We have to have extensive outreach to minority communities to allow them to see people like me 
and others who have had a career, a successful career, and have managed to, to gain a foothold uh, in the workplace, in the foreign affairs arena. I'm a firm believer in internships uh, early on in high school, giving people exposure to this. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we need to do. Secondly, once people enter uh, the workforce and they're inside the agencies, you need to have ways to mentor and support people to become sponsors of individuals that you believe are talented, uh, to give them the opportunity to have the wide, broad experiences that they need to create a successful career. I certainly was fortunate to have that among the many mentors and, and, and leaders that I worked for, and I've adopted that uh, in my approach to management. So the next question, one thing you note about your Peace Corps experience is that it helps you build resilience. It's often said that Peace Corps volunteers have, gr have grit. In your opinion, is it the type of work and training that, that develops that, or do the people who choose to serve come in with that? You know, it's interesting. I had a great conversation one time about that with my, my dear friend and, and colleague, the, uh, the great Ambassador Pam White who, as you know, is a person who has a lot of resilience and a lot of grit. <laughs> and uh, we went back and forth on that. But I think that resilience and grit can be developed. I don't think I don't think I was a very resilient person when I went into the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic. But in order to be a successful volunteer and work effectively with my with my other Peace Corps colleagues and uh, and with my Dominican counterparts and to serve the Dominican teachers that I was responsible for. I had to develop resiliency and, and be and be a person that had to have grit. I think it can be developed. I think you have to give our people the opportunity to learn. And more importantly, Rick, they need to have the opportunity to fail because failure is the greatest gift you can, you can receive or you can give someone in order to propel them to greater heights. Great. Uh, I think that's really... There's just so much of those kinds of insights throughout your book. So Tom Eggert from Madison asks, given all of the changes in the world during the last 60 years, is the Peace Corps still relevant? What is the return on the investment by the U.S.? That's your next book, but I, we'll give you a couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Tom, for that question. I think, it, yes, it is relevant because I think now more than ever before, the United States needs to remain engaged in the global world. We have to. If we've learned anything from the COVID pandemic, we have got to be interconnected in order to protect the global humanity, if you will, the, the human race. Uh, secondly, as now that we're interrelated, we need to learn more about uh, other cultures. We need to speak foreign languages. We need to have an exchange of ideas. We need to see each other across all boundaries. And the Peace Corps is a way for young Americans, uh, along with many other organizations, Peace Corps is just one, one vehicle for learning about the outside world in a positive structured way that can allow you to develop that kind of cultural agility that will then, uh, when you return home, you can become a much better global citizen because we need to develop more global citizens across the country. That's one of the great things I think about the University of Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin is a global uh, institution of higher learning that is focused on engagement globally. And that's important. Great. Uh, interdependence is clearly where we've got to be. So the next question, you talked about taking risks in Washington as necessary to succeed. What risk panned out best? And was there one that didn't turn out as you might have wanted? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a really good question. What risk term panned out best? I think um, in terms of Peace Corps, uh, we decided to move forward and push for a larger budget that would allow us to expand the Peace Corps and move into five new countries. Uh, that, there was a risk there. We could easily have uh, been much more cautious and built up existing programs, but we decided to move forward. For example, when the Arab Spring occurred, uh, we were very fortunate that uh, the Obama administration uh, created a space for Peace Corps to reintroduce Peace Corps in, into Tunisia. And so I think that's, that's you have to take those kinds of measured risks. And then in terms of risks that, that didn't turn out so well, what I talked about early in my career when I was in Honduras, where I, we, we were gung-ho and hell-bent to, to plant uh, tomatoes in the Central Valley of Honduras and found out that 
we could not do so. And so we had to reverse course and plant cucumbers, which became a very successful industry, uh, agribusiness in Honduras. So, you know, there's been a few uh, moments a along the way, without a doubt. So here's a, another question from Madison. Um, I'm a Fulbright scholar at UW-Madison. I'm not a U.S. citizen as well. Can I join the Peace Corps as a volunteer? I would love to do that. What other, what other options would you recommend if not? Well, unfortunately, only in your case, only U.S. citizens can join the Peace Corps. But there are many, many NGOs that work globally uh, that do outstanding work. And uh, you already, obviously, you're a Fulbright, so you're obviously a highly regarded uh, person who obviously has a great resume and would be welcome, I'm sure, by these organizations. It's a matter of networking and, and trying to find out which ones might be of interest to you in an area of your expertise or area of your academic concentration. But there's lots of ways now, many more ways, hundreds of ways more than there were when I first joined the Peace Corps. So I would encourage you to do that. So another questioner says, you, you have an MBA, but have spent much of your career in international development and public service. Can you talk more about that path, those choices? And I would add as well, talk about General Mills and, and some of your private sector experiences uh, when, you, when you came right out with your MBA. Well, I have an inherent bias, Rick. I believe in a multi-sector career, right? <clears throat> And I learned that in the Peace Corps. Uh, after I came back from the Peace Corps, I decided I was going to try to uh, attain a, a degree that would give me options to work both in business and in government. And the MBA was that degree. It doesn't have to be an MBA, but for me, that was ideal. Because first of all, my MBA was my ticket to the Fortune 500. I worked for two Fortune 500 corporations after I left the University of Wisconsin. And that gave me, that was a real education. Anyone who's worked in at that level in corporations of, of that caliber, you know it's another education. You learn about the bottom line, you work with a group of peers who are highly motivated, determined uh, to, to push their product or their company forward. Uh, you learn about you know, how you can work with consumers' attitudes. You learn about leadership and teamwork and hard work and discipline. And so those are things that you can then easily carry to the, throughout the rest of your career. So I deliberately chose to work in all three sectors, in business, government, and in the nonprofit world, because I thought that was, that was the way I could make a difference in the world. And I think that uh, a multi-sector career in this, in this day and age is probably going to be a much more popular and, and predominant because young people now are moving around, right? They're, they're not going to be the lifers like you and I were, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. There's going to be the, that agility. And I think making the career in and out, we're seeing that with our, our fellows here in our program at Princeton. The next question is from, I, I don't, I'm going to say Caleb or Caleb Mack from Atlanta, who asks, how do you handle uncertainty? I think uh, uncertainty is a part of the world we live in, in any professional setting, in any organization. And so what you need to do, you need to, you need to have your data analytics well-structured, right? Uh, you need to know what is the baseline of, of, of the issues, of the strategy, or the problem that you're trying to, to manage. And then you need to have the right people in the room, right? This goes back to my earlier, earlier discussion about hire or bring on board the best people you can find, the smartest people, the people who are smarter than you, the people who will speak truth to power, who will push back on you and give you the best possible advice. That, if you do that, if you have your data down, if you have the right people in the room and you're prepared to be a risk taker, that gives you quite an arsenal to deal with uncertainty, I have found in my career. So we're getting near the end of the questions and a couple personal questions here. What are your favorite memories from Madison? And what is the biggest lesson you took away from the university? So this is your Badger moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, at the, at the business school, in the graduate school of business, at that point in time, uh, in, in the early 70s, I was surrounded by a, group, a cohort of outstanding students. Many of them were engineers who were coming back to school to get their MBA to move into higher positions in management. Uh, there were many foreign students who were sent by their government who would end up going back to become ministers and even presidents of their countries. 
Uh, so it was a high level of talent, and we pushed each other very hard. And we were in the presence of outstanding professors who really pushed us at the, at the highest level of, uh, the business, of the business concentrations wherever you might be studying. That's number one. Number two, I formed a lot of great friendships in Madison, friends who are still my friends to this day, people who had, interestingly enough, a Peace Corps background. Uh, we're friends. We travel together. Uh, that's Those always bring back wonderful memories when I think about Madison. And uh, I think the other thing is that one of the great investments in America, one of the greatest things that America has is a research institution of the caliber of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It is a marvelous place that does so much good in the world and provides young people, and both at the undergraduate and graduate level, a chance to develop their skill set and their academic foundation and go out and become leaders in the world on all the major issues that we face in every sector, in every region of the world. There's nothing better than that. So I think we've got. I think we're being asked to move towards our closing statements. And what I'd like to do, I, I've asked you to to read from your book more than usual because I just want people to get a real flavor for it and make sure that they get a chance to go out and buy it. But I, I wonder if you could go to that conversation you had with Julian Bond on page two thirty seven, where you kind of lay out your your mm -hmm. principles of leadership. And I think it's, it's, I think it's a great place for me to take you before you just add your own conclusion, but I'd love to have you read that if you would. Thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you very much. So I had the unique opportunity to discuss my views on leadership with the legendary Julian Bond, the famed civil rights leader and social activist. He, I was privileged that he interviewed me as part of his series on leadership. And I shared some of my thoughts. The first lesson is that we grow most by challenging ourselves, by stepping out of our comfort zone. One should take calculated risks because tremendous personal growth and resilience will come down from such an effort. The second is that some of the most important things in life are positive relationships. Whether it is in the realm of politics, diplomacy, or business, real change comes in the very personal interactions between real people. Related to this is that one should always hire talented people. You can never have too many smart people on your team and such teams make better decisions. The third is that I have always believed that America's multiracial and multi-ethnic diversity is one of our great strengths. And so it is crucial that we seek ways to pursue diversity across all organizations. I have always tried to be proactive in such efforts throughout my multi-sector career. And the fourth is that service is, isn't just about a moment in time. Service is a mindset for life. Whatever field you choose, whatever line of work, you can always find ways to help others. And when you start your career with a service mindset, it becomes an integral part of your approach to life. Well, thank you, my friend, for including me in this homecoming at Wisconsin. And I, if you have any final, final thoughts, I think this last minute is yours. Thank you, Rick. And thank you for being so gracious to accept uh, this charge to have this conversation <laughs> with me. I can't. It was wonderful. And I'll just say that I'm very privileged and fortunate, first of all, that I had a chance to serve in the Peace Corps, which meant everything to me, changed my life. And then thirdly, secondly, I am honored and privileged that I had a chance to come full circle and become the director of the Peace Corps and work hard with my team to provide opportunities for young Americans to serve around the world to create global citizens that can make a difference and to continue to promote peace and friendship worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really sorry that we need to put an end to this fascinating discussion, uh, but somebody has to do it and that's my role. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank Aaron Williams and Ambassador Rick Barton for this exceptional program. I have no doubt that many who are listening, particularly students, will find inspiration in Aaron's life and accomplishments. A special thanks to my colleague Barry Gerhard for his participation. Thank you again for, to our co-sponsors. We appreciate your assistance in making this event a reality. 
While this event may be over, there are many more events planned for International Education Week. View this, the event calendar in, at IEW International WISEDU, please. If you are interested in more information about Peace Corps service, visit peacecorps.wis.edu. And finally, learn how you can obtain a copy of A Life and Imagine by Aaron Williams at the international.wis.edu life and imagine. Thank you to all of you for attending and have a great evening. Thanks. Yeah.